Hi all, thank you for joining us today on the Waste Masterclass. We're going to be talking about data-led innovation to overcome Australia's waste challenge. I'm Blake Lindley, uh, I'm presenting this session today. Just some housekeeping before we start. Uh, you'll see that little blue hand at the top right of your screen. Please use that to lodge any questions as we go. If anything pipes your interest, you want more further clarity on or, or, or interested in understanding more about, please don't hesitate to use that. What we do not get to, uh, we will provide written answers following the conference. Um, we're going to be running through about 30 minutes of presentation, which we are kicking off uh, now, and then we're going to follow that up with a 15-minute Q&A, focusing on the questions uh, that you guys have provided. So what we're covering today, uh, I'm going to run you through three distinct components in this presentation. The first is what, uh, sorry, why we measure. I want to understand and I want to give you guys an understanding of where Neighbours Waste sits in the scope of greater challenges, in the scope of carbon emissions, and in the scope of a circular economy and a, tra a transition towards that nationally. Secondly, getting started, some really practical nuts and bolts, bits and pieces on how you track, how you rate, and how you actually use that tool uh, to, to achieve the outcomes you need. Thirdly, taking action. This is about when we translate measurement into management. When we do measure, that is half the challenge. Obviously, we do that with a view to improvement. So we're going to be focusing on what tools are available to you in market and how you can, who you can turn to actually to deliver best practice in your building or in your organization. So why we measure? I'm going to start here. This graph, you'll see that line there is from around 1990 to around 2020, the global emissions and greenhouse gas concentrations rather in the atmosphere, topping out about 407 parts per million last year. This needs to be the decade of action on sustainability. And I want to, what I want to share with you is where waste sits in that greater challenge. Waste is truly a production and consumption system. It is not just the disposal and removal of materials. In a production and consumption system, we have a bevy of impacts, and particularly carbon impacts, which occur throughout that in transportation and material production, and then obviously eventually in disposal. You'll know now that all the states in Australia have net zero targets. They've all committed by 2050 to being net zero. Neighbours waste is absolutely critical to that. It is the way that we are operationalising change in this sector uh, and through this industry. This is a graph that I love to refer to. It's from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation who are thought leaders in circular economy. And it outlines really the role that circular economy has to play in a low carbon or low emissions trajectory. In that graph, it's quite apparent. You'll see energy, 55%. Uh, accounts for emissions globally, and the production consumption system, as we refer to it, is 45%. It is truly essential to understand that intrinsic link of emissions and waste. Neighbours now provides a climate active or carbon neutral rating, which you can achieve as a building or an organisation, and that is actually a combined rating of energy and waste. It sets out really clearly the linkage between carbon uh, and emissions and waste. Better managing our waste is a critical way for organisations to take leadership in climate action, not just waste management. I want to highlight this with a, with, a, with a slide I've borrowed from Darren Perrin, who's a great, uh, a great consultant, works with Ricardo um, in Australia. And this slide is something he presented recently on, and I saw it and I said, that makes perfect sense. Uh, this is, I suppose, a hierarchical structure of strategies and policy, and yes, you know, without getting too carried away, um, there's a policy for everything these days, I suppose, but it puts in context where we need to be when we talk about both sustainability and circular economy and waste. Traditionally, waste has always been, you know, a capacity to handle materials. When we had recycling policies, it was, you know, how do we manage these more efficiently or how do we get them into the right bin? A circular economy strategy, and where I'm going to run you through uh, the role of neighbours, starts addressing those concepts of how do we minimise waste and maximise value coming out of these systems. 
And like I said before, linkage of that to net zero strategies and overall sustainability, which is longevity without impact. The time for action is now. We have a huge number of macroeconomic and, and macro political, geopolitical impacts on the waste sector currently. Ensuring that we take uh, or, or harness that momentum and that change that's happening right now in a positive way is going to be absolutely critical to uh, the future of waste management in Australia. You'll see there China National Sword, and I'm going to rip through these very quickly, so excuse uh, uh, how brief I'm being here. But the banning of import of materials in 2018 set off a huge instability in terms of supply and demand for international commodities uh, and has changed the face of recycling. The CAG waste export bans, which have in a way been a response to that, are now affecting waste fibre, paper, cardboard, plastics, glass, tyres, among others, um, which are going to be banned mid-2021. You'll have seen potentially the uh, $190 million announced by the federal government to support waste and recycling infrastructure um, in the country moving forward. Thirdly, the APCO uh, national packaging targets. These set out guidelines for 100% reusable, recyclable and compostable packaging uh, and 50% average recycled content in the packaging used in Australia. So there's a lot of movement happening there. Thirdly, I mentioned earlier the government strategies, policies in development now, circular economy policies, net zero strategies which have been committed to, all these are paving the way for significant change in the waste sector. Collecting clear data through the neighbours tool potentially is the way that you need uh, to, uh, I suppose, or the way that you can input to this system. Circular economy is something that we're hearing more and more about and we know that there is strategies and policies under development in this space. Uh, it's something being enacted by organisations individually. What we need to understand is this is a systems level or a conceptual framework really uh, in which to view economic development. It's a triple bottom line approach decoupling growth from the consumption of finite resources. It aims to maintain, not diminish, natural capital, social capital and economic capital. But with all that, it becomes almost a systemic or wicked problem in terms of a transition. So we want to focus today really on how you can take action uh, exactly in that space. We need to understand the system in order to understand the role. I'm going to rip through really quickly just three slides on circular economy. And we start here with the world. When we look at it, when we zoom right out, we see a system that operates in isolation in a way. There's nothing coming in and out from it. Uh, all natural processes are circular and that is actually the inspiration um, for the circular economy. The traditional or, or post-industrial model of our economy itself is a take, make, use, dispose. It's something we call linear. Um, when we impose that on a natural system, we have naturally uh, input and output from that. We try through the circular economy to turn that on itself. It becomes a take, make, use and return. And I like to use return there for one, because it indicates the ability to take and reuse or to see value in something. And secondly, to profit from an investment. This is, uh, I guess, a way to, as I said, regenerate natural capital. Um, it is a way that we can actually do better collectively as society, as the environment and as an economy um, moving forward. The principles that govern the circular economy um, are threefold. These are, the, these are developed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundations and essentially provide a little bit of guidance on exactly, uh, or a framework I suppose, in order to decision make in this space. Number one, design out waste and pollution. The essence of this is that recycling should never justify consumption. If it's in your hand and you're putting it in the recycling bin, then you need to question why you had it consumed in the first place. Where we can avoid and reduce even recyclable materials in the first place is a critical place to start. Secondly, when we look at keeping our products and materials in use, this is about cycling, it's about reusing, it's about refurbishing, it allows new thought, new leadership in new business models. Can we offer take backs? Can we actually uh, you know, uh, lease to buy. There is a myriad of different models now, sharing economy, which fit under this. It's about circulating materials and repairing, recovering, reusing, 
as much as possible. It's our responsibility as facility owners, managers, uh, to present and ensure the highest possible value is maintained in products throughout that system. Thirdly, regenerating natural systems, when it does come to recycling product, we need to take ownership of exactly how that's presented. Are we collecting it? Are we sorting it? And are we delivering it to the services, the recycling industry, in the way that's going to allow them to extract the highest order value from it? And that leads me neatly into getting started, I think, taking ownership of circular economy. There's a lot in that systems level approach, but there's one easy point to get started. And that is rating and collecting data. Neighbours is the tool that's developed as a national program. It's been refreshed two years ago and now with 1.3 million square metres of office space rated, we see a 50% increase year on year now of how, uh, of how much space, uh, sorry, 50% increase in users year on year um, since it's refreshed two years ago. The office buildings themselves are the only sector that has uh, the ability to rate. Um, we have thorough benchmarking in that sector now, which has led us to the point where we're able to offer star ratings. The neighbours accredited pathway or accelerated pathway is in place now for a range of other sectors. That includes aged care, apartment buildings, shopping centres, you can see them on the screen there. These are all buildings or really anyone. There is no limit actually to who can adopt and use the neighbours tool right now. And I urge you all to do that. It is uh, the waste tracking tool that provides consistency uh, and regularity and comparability in data. And it's a great way to provide, um, to feed that, you know, the data you're collecting back to those that need it in policy making and otherwise. Moving on to how you get a rating. This is broken into two parts. The first is simple building registration. That is, uh, by, oh, sorry, rather by doing so, you'll have full access to the waste tracking platform, which I'll run you through shortly. That's a brilliant way to visualize, understand, and eventually manage waste in your buildings. When we, uh, to get to that point, we need to upload data. Uh, we start with 12 months. For a rating, you need to have 12 months. You might be starting from month one, which is also totally fine. Uh, if you have historical data, that can also be uploaded to give you a snapshot right now of where you're at and how you improve moving forward from there. The submission for a rating. Once, uh, this is again only available for office buildings at this point, but when you submit for a rating, you will require the assistance of an accredited assessor. You can find who those people are on the neighbor's website very easily. Uh, and that really is just a matter, a matter of getting the ducks in a row to submit for a star rating. Uh, the purpose of the star rating is really to make a comparable, visual, easily communicable means of comparison across industry. Uh, it allows you really to track improvements that you might be working on and also to communicate the, the quality, I suppose, of your tenancy and the services you provide um, clearly to market. On the neighbors tool to track waste, you'll see here a screenshot of the waste tracking platform itself. This is all dummy data, of course, but I think it lets you get a hold and get a grasp on what, uh, what you can achieve, what you can deliver um, and manage through this platform. You can go as deep as you like, you can pick off your focus areas. Once you understand what are your material impacts, your material categories and challenges in waste, it allows you to be much more focused in how you can approach the management of them. When you look at this screen here to run through top left, uh, from the top left rather, you'll see waste generation by waste type. There's bar charts, you can visualize that the way you want. It gives you a relative uh, view on amounts of waste generated across each of those streams. You can view that as a pie chart as well uh, in the middle there. It's also very simple to uh, track costs. So, you know, we like to see paybacks a lot of times on when we are working on uh, any of these sustainability initiatives. This will allow you to track and measure the cost of each stream, how that might change, and you should also receive reflected uh, volume change when you see that cost change. Uh, 
Uh, on the bottom row there, you're going to see waste generation in total. We want to work on reducing that. As I said, I think uh, the outgoings of a building, when we look at recycling, that should not justify consumption. If we can move that down, uh, then that's a great way to do better under a circular economy lens. Similarly, waste intensity. Tracking how tenants perform, uh, it does allow you the input and the clarity on, on how different, different buildings in your portfolio, how different tenants even potentially, if you're working with an assessor for more detail, uh, are performing. It allows you comparability. You can see you know, and, and track the exact, uh, I guess, benefits of initiatives that might be focused on reducing waste intensity in your buildings. Lastly, recycling rate and fully exportable into Excel uh, and other files. We're going to touch now in terms of mechanics, I guess, on, on a few of the ways you can increase your rating. The Neighbours Tool does a brilliant job of harmonising and packaging up a lot of detailed work that's been done by Gecko, that's been done by the Better Buildings Partnership for some years. Packages, packages that up very neatly uh, for you in, in a very usable sort of way. There's three ways um, that you can really look at improving your data quality over time. Uh, that is the data quality assessment process includes contamination adjustment and the second there, sorry, there's three ways you can improve data overall. The first two, contamination and data quality, fall under the data quality assessment. The third is, uh, the second is the material recovery score that you'll see there and I'm going to explain them uh, in a little more detail just now. This is a somewhat technical table. Um, that you can refer to, but I'm going to explain now how uh, this affects data quality. When we measure um, or when we track waste at a building, you, the, the tool itself is inbuilt with a number of mechanisms to streamline its use. That makes it extremely easy for you to get started to get a good grasp or initial snapshot on how waste is being managed. The tool will encourage you over time to take greater ownership and develop greater clarity in how that reporting happens. We do this through uh, bin weight calculations. When we look at waste, we actually want to convert to weight. But you'll know most of the time uh, collections are happening via a container, which is a volume measure. That bin might not always be full. The density and composition might vary from site to site. It might vary across the portfolio or region to region. Understanding those things uh, in more detail will help you improve your rating and also improve the accuracy of your reporting. We try to move you from industry standard densities through to site densities and actual weights in order to address that. Secondly, contamination. Not all material collected through the recycling stream is recycling. So we do need to adjust that for its contaminated component. Um, we start again with an industry standard. We work towards a site site uh, average, sorry, um, and then further onto weighed and measured stream by stream contamination. We often see things like organics far less contaminated than uh, you know a yellow lid bin service, for example. In the MRS, uh, this is the material recovery score. This is a new addition to neighbours in the past year, but it speaks to a lot of the circular economy principles that we started on today. It is the mechanism to drive us towards maximizing the value of the outputs from our buildings and it allows you to take a bit of ownership beyond the extent of your control as to how materials move and flow through the economy. What it really does is collect uh, or, or, or provide guidance to users on what the highest order recovery are. There are differences in whether or not it's going as a mixed stream, whether or not it's sole separated, and also the infrastructure that might be processing it at its end of life. It's that next step beyond the collection service, pushing ownership and uh, accountability um, to deliver better outcomes for tenants down the line uh, in order to deliver sort of circular economy uh, outcomes. Again, we, by putting things in a recycling bin, we haven't always achieved a lot. We need to develop uh, systems which maximise the recovery so that we can re-implement them as recycled content in new materials and thus lower embodied energy and emissions across the board. Uh, recycled content we're going to touch on a little bit later, but it's an essential part of making this entire system function. 
I want to run through a super quick exercise now. I often think about this. Um, when we're approaching system level challenges, it's sometimes hard to understand where our control is and where, what we're able to control and what we're able to influence and in what way. This is a simple methodology which uh, we often work with clients on and, it, and we, we are trying to focus on areas of direct control as a short term implementable actionable measure to take. Uh, followed by direct influence and indirect influence, how we can contribute and affect those upstream and downstream of us in order to reach a, a collectively agreed outcome. Might be circular economy, lower emissions, uh, a low economy trajectory for the economy. There's three definitions here. Direct control, you'll see that. Internal operations. Uh, and then secondly, direct influence, how we procure, how we contract downstream, and how we st uh, start shaping opinions of even those that we interact with. Thirdly, indirect influence. These are often very outside. This is state level, potentially if you're a building owner, for example, state level infrastructure and the like. To test that, I tried putting together a bit of an idea, a bit of a guess on where these would fall depending on your part in the supply chain. As I said, this is an essential way of uh, looking at short term, mid time and even long term goals. And if you understand the waste industry, you understand that transparency is quite difficult to come to. Um, when you are a tenant or a building owner, you have direct responsibility to look at setting internal targets, to providing waste services, to educating staff, uh, but you don't have control of state level infrastructure and policy. This is uh, the neighbor's tool offers a platform to correct that, uh, collect that data in a consistent way in order for you to collaborate in that process of policy making and education uh, and policy informing moving forward. I urge you all to collect consistent data, work on data quality um, and take a look to reflect on that diagram there to see where you can be most impactful doing so depending on where you fall in the supply chain. Just unpick really quickly in an office building a tenant, uh, a tenant landlord issue. Uh, this is a, a classic example of where we can control and where we can influence. I've tried putting out there and outlining really the role of building management, which is delivering access to waste services. We want the best and uh, sorry, we want the most available streams and the highest order recovery uh, of those, which lends into the, leads, into, leads into the next, which is material recovery score. Secondly, reporting. How clear and how confident are we in the reporting? Do we have tenant specific reporting, which a lot of office buildings in particular might ask for? Tenants, conversely, are the ones that are responsible for on the floor activity. It's the culture of the place, it's education, it's inductions um, and training on using the services provided by the building management. I think that's the, the constant frustration on both sides uh, is that you both can't control these two things. Setting internal targets, engaging your own employees is uh, a really effective way to go about that. Where we need to overlap is contamination management. So we need the necessary education to, be, to come through. It needs to be communicated then in, a, in a, a, sorry, the necessary education and knowledge from the building managers and the waste service providers to find their way through the tenants who can educate in their own way on how uh, their users should do better. Secondly, engagement and signage. Tenants often elect to use their own signage. It might want to be branded. It might want to be in theme with a fit out, for example. Uh, and the same with engagement initiatives, posters and the like. It's about building a supportive, collaborative uh, space where you're both exerting positive influence um, or understanding how you influence one and the other uh, in order to align to a greater good of really, um, on a building scale, reducing recycling, sorry, increasing recycling, reducing waste to landfill and improving recovery outcomes. Lastly on that, if you want to become an assessor, there's a simple Neighbours Essentials course you can take off, gives you an overview of the whole process. There's then two required uh, courses. They're both about a half day with an exam, but you can pick up much more information on those online. To taking action, um, when, we, when we measure, that's the essential way for us to take a snapshot, to understand where we're at, and then logically move forward and progress and improve. That requires on how effectively we can translate that knowledge into improvement. 
I'm going to touch on now five resources, five uh, areas of um, impact that you can be taking action on as either a tenant or a building owner. Um, there is a bit of a focus on office uh, buildings in this instance um, out of necessity due to, due to them being the, uh, the most, I suppose, progressed sector um, on the neighbor's tool. That's not to discount any of the other ones. We're on the accelerated pathway to get those sectors up to speed as soon as possible as well. I'm going to start. I mentioned the BBP or the Better Buildings Partnership earlier. The Neighbours Tool was informed very closely by the work of the BBP. And whilst the Neighbours Tool sets out a framework to reward and acknowledge the work that is done, if you want to know how to improve your contamination ratings, if you want to know how to improve the waste management on site, and also if you want to know how to improve data quality scores, the BBP operational waste guidelines are the way that you can do that. They set out standards from how to develop a waste management uh, plan for your site to actually ensure continuity uh, and best practice in light of changing resources, changing contractors and the like. Um, and it also looks uh, at basically constant feedback improvement and the like on site. It matches neatly and was informed uh, or, or informed to a great degree also the GECA requirements for waste collection services. This is a standard that takes um, industry best practice, I suppose, and operationalizes it. It sets out a criteria for contractors to meet in order to achieve uh, best practice. GECA is the body that externally verifies that and certifies it so you can have confidence when you're working with a GECA certified waste contractor that they're going to be providing you all of the data um, and information you need in a consistent, in the correct format, meshed with neighbors very neatly, um, and in a compliant format. They can also upload it to your neighbor's tool on your behalf, um, which leaves you just with the, the uh, energy, I suppose, in terms of monitoring and managing, which is where we want to be. Thirdly, separate your organics. You cannot get past three stars without organic separation. This is a graph from a, uh, you know, published data on, from a life cycle perspective on common fruit and veg household goods. You'll see there dairy products, um, fruit and veg, meat. In all cases, the consumed food um, or the wasted food as well um, is actually the majority component. Packaging is only a very small component of, of uh, overall product impact when we look uh, on a life cycle lens. Similarly, when we look at recycled content, um, when recycled content goes in, it offsets virgin materials, and that actually uh, has a massive impact on carbon emissions. It's essential to think, when you're looking at recycling, are we buying back the same amount every week as we're putting out? Thirdly, re recycling should never justify consumption. If you think we're doing as much as you can do by recycling, then you need to look, really, there's three steps above that. Reuse, reduce, and avoid. Um, again, do not use the recycling system, I suppose, as a means to justify consumption. I'll touch on a few industry uh, resources, and you're all on your own uh, can go out and look for these. But the City Switch, the three on the left there, Beyond the Bin, Eliminating Single Use, Plastic Free Guidelines from the City Switch program, great resources to understand what and where you can recycle, engagement campaigns, plug and play type of stuff which you can take out um, and implement in your organization. Pony Up for Good, e-waste collection that also supports a cause. Oz Harvest, you'd be probably quite familiar with, food waste donation collection. Ecoactive is a bespoke collection take back program that you can use for a variety of materials. Um, urge you to go check out that one. The Grateful and the Generous speaks more to off, you know, stationery and office supplies, furniture and the like at end of life. There's some great work also done by the BBP in the strip out waste guidelines, which you can look at there. Design is a software that allows you to create attractive, easy to use and easy and personalized signage in your tenancies. Um, so I'm going to leave those with you uh, to take a look at. Uh, and in closing, look, we've covered today really three things. It's why we measure. We are facing a greater challenge and working under the larger parameter of net zero ambitions. Waste is a critical part of that transition pathway. Getting started, the Neighbours Tool, it is the industry standard and national best practice on waste reporting, providing consistent 
and clear data to policymakers is the way that you can inform and best service policymaking and industry systemic change in this space. Lastly, taking action. Organics is always going to be a focus. I urge you to start there. Operationalizing waste procedures uh, is, is another, um, and making use of all the resources already been done uh, in industry is going to very much help you along the line of taking action and taking a proactive approach to waste management. I'm going to kick into question and answers now, and I can see that the questions have been coming in uh, throughout the session. I'm just having to work off an iPad now here. I'm going to kick off. I've got an interesting one. You guys are cut straight to the chase. Um, but it's one that we should definitely address. Is there any, any point in rating when the recycling system is so broken? Um, thank you for that one. Uh, I'm sure it, it was probably something everyone wanted to ask. Um, the, the recycling industry is in a state of flux. I think it's absolutely fair to say, and we touched on that with National Sword, the CAG waste bans and the like. Um, change is a great opportunity for improvement. To plan improvement, we need to collect data. And this comes back to, I think, the overall premise of the presentation. Collecting data in a consistent, clear way is the best way that we can manage to the future now. We encourage, and, and I think it's absolutely essential, I, I believe it's even now free until mid next year for buildings under uh, 1,000 square metres or tenants under 1,000 square metres to rate. Um, that's been a new initiative, I think, announced by neighbours recently. So the more data that we can get helps us fill in those gaps that we have when we're looking at regional infrastructure, when we're looking at material recycling, what we need, um, what's out there in the sector. Uh, that is, uh, even if we may not be hitting the outcomes we want now in the recycling uh, sector, then it's going to help us plan for the future. So I urge you really to take make use of the Neighbours platform as best you can. Um, I've got one here. Do you have any advice on how to make sure we aren't purchasing greenwash products? Thank you, Tom, for that. Uh, it's a bit of a minefield out there. You're absolutely right. Uh, when we look at recycled content, there is no established, um, fully established sort of labeling system. I know APCO, which is the Australian Packaging Covenant Organization, when it comes to labeling, particularly on materials, they are the body in Australia which you should be looking at for that. Uh, it's currently under development. The Australian Recycling Label does a great job of directing disposal right now. Uh, there's other system, uh, other methods you can look at. The Forestry Stewardship Council, for example, for paper products to keep it relevant to offices. Um, you should be looking for recycled content and, and well-stewarded forest products um, in that space. I'll touch briefly on compostables um, just to clear that up. And I'll direct you again to an APCO report, which was published, uh, might have been back in March this year. Uh, considerations on compostable packaging, it's called. Please have a look at that. Um, compostable products are governed by, or, or the labelling program, uh, the seedling label is governed by the Australian Bioplastics Association um, and is required on all compostable packaging products. Simply writing compostable on there does not mean under uh, consumer law that it actually is. So please be very savvy. Um, that document is going to do a much better and concise way of explaining it than I will do right now. So I'll leave you to do some further reading um, in that space. Uh, I've been asked as well, thank you, Simon, how do I get waste contractors to play ball? I would suggest there, the Neighbours platform has now been out for some time in its refreshed form. Uh, they've been operating and seeing this in market for two years and have been consulted extensively in its creation. Generally, it should just be a matter of asking for that service, uh, for reporting in that consistent way, um, taking the opportunity uh, in the procurement phase to set that up is going to be um, your best bet. Obviously, under contract, there is only so much leeway we can get. 
um, without sort of significantly altering uh, the way business is done. So make sure that you're, you understand where you sit. If you've got a, a plus, plus, plus contract on your waist, take the opportunities, you know, when that renews um, to ask for more from your con uh, contractors. Similarly, if we have the industry asking for a consistent metric or a consistent process, it's going to be much easier uh, or, or much more apparent to the recycling sector that this is what's being demanded. So again, consistency, uh, the more we ask, the more we will receive really um, in terms of getting waste contractors on board with, with, with this type of activity. Um, I've been asked again, and I touched on it briefly, but maybe I will uh, just expand a little bit further. What is the point of having a GECA certified waste contractor as well as a neighbor's rating? Um, firstly, it does take a lot of the onus off you uh, in the assessment process in terms of running the neighbor's platform, uh, running, sorry, the neighbor's rating and achieving a neighbor's rating yourself. Uh, GECA, Good Environmental Choice Australia, fulfills the role of verifying um, those who abide to their standards. So it takes a bit of the onus off, off uh, yourself uh, in terms of managing those contracts. You know that if someone is certified to GECA, that they are hitting all of the requirements for um, data quality, for measuring, um, uh, measurement and reporting can upload to the neighbor's platform and are delivering best practice in that. Similarly, it's recognised the neighbor's, neighbor's platform that if you're using a GECA certified contractor, you do not need to verify with a second source of data um, in terms of your reporting. Uh, without getting into that too far, it does simplify on-site processes, which you traditionally need not just an invoice or an account of what was collected, but secondary sources as well. For example, weight-based billing, bin counts and all those things. So there is a very practical element of that. Um, that would be the benefit of, of I think, working with a, uh, a GECA certified contractor. Uh, I got another one here. Will rating, uh, will rating to neighbours save me or cost me money? Um, that is going to be a little bit hard to answer without a direct context. Um, measuring and rating to the neighbours platform will cost you money. Um, depending on your situation, if you're a 40 storey office building or if you're a very small, uh, you know, thousand square metre office block, um, the cost of doing that is going to be uh, proportionally quite different. Uh, to just use the waste tracking tool, I believe it's around $450 a year and I think to rate it's about $1,200 at this point. To when you adopt those and internalize those costs, I think the, the, and I'll share with you some examples of how we've actually saved a lot of money by doing so. When we measure in that consistent way, it does allow us much greater focus in terms of priority areas uh, and improvements, which might in the long run start costing, uh, sorry, start saving you money. Landfills traditionally a very expensive way to get rid of waste. Um, and you'll see essentially when we can actually, uh, when we're measuring clearly, we can track improvement uh, and you will see reductions in your waste costs over time. Uh, we have rolled out organics that has saved in the case of some large commercial buildings, um, many, many tens of thousands of dollars a year off a waste bill. Um, around 70% of office waste is typically recyclable. And when we measure, when we use the waste platform, although it does cost an upfront fee, you're going to get that clarity and understanding of how you can actually direct improvement before. So again, I've skirted around that one. It's going to be specific to your individual situation. Um, it is very cheap to use the tool without rating, without publicating, uh, publishing to industry what your rating is. So I urge you all to do that because I think you'll find a great deal of input if it is um, futile charges from waste collectors, there's, there's situations where waste bins are not full. The data quality process ensures best practice management from your site team. You'll get a lot of efficiency uh, and make sure you're not lifting air, to put it crudely, um, just by running through the data quality and improvement systems inbuilt to the tool. Um, I've got another one here uh, from Tian. 
Um, what are the opportunities to be taken out from the federal government newly announced um, Recycling Modernization Fund? That is, the takeouts from there is I think it, it, that this is a, again an industry in change. There is huge, I think this is only really the start of what we're going to see. We've seen also announced last week the stewardship programs. That's encouraging industry to take a lot more ownership of uh, the materials flowing into your buildings. Um, the Recycling Modernization Fund and the Infrastructure Development Funds are both focused on supporting Australia's transition to uh, an industry which can actually look after itself. I think in light of, you know, in light of COVID, in light of global supply chains, challenges we've seen across the board, um, recycled textiles no longer being able to be sent offshore due to uh, concerns with coronavirus, uh, the need to actually be a lot more self-sufficient in this space. So key takeaways there, there is, uh, the government money is really a cherry to attract much more, many times the amount of uh, funding that they offer up there through the government into this sector. And I think getting that private sector investment in um, is going to drastically change the opportunities and scope that we have uh, for improvement. Um, I've got another one here from uh, Jasrina. Based on a recent chat I had with neighbours, uh, I understand the waste rating is completely based on the separation of the materials at source. However, it does not consider monitor the end use and processing component to confirm if it is eventually recycled or recovered. So that's reflecting, that's coming back to the uh, material recovery score. There are standardized values, as I said. When you register the neighbor's platform, we want to make it as easy and simple and as least cost as possible. So it's inbuilt with a number of industry factors, industry standard factors that we understand from benchmarking. You have the opportunity through further, uh, I guess, interrogation um, and effort on site to improve that rating. What they do is positively inflect your rating. Um, so you can absolutely have a rating, you can track, uh, you don't need to, at this point, you're not required to take on um, burden or ownership of the outcomes, uh, by which I mean the facilities and the products that you're recycling will go into. By doing so, you absolutely do have the opportunity to positively affect your rating. Um, Harry, uh, I see that you can now add container deposit scheme to the waste platform. Are there many people using that? Uh, really quick one to finish on. Yes, uh, with the container deposit scheme, we do get actually a cleaner stream. Um, it is able to move into higher order recovery, which is a great benefit. Similarly, we do see uh, it emerging in office spaces as a way to support charities. So whether or not that is done by tenants, and sometimes it's even floor by floor or sector by sector within a tenant, um, or on a building level, people are using it as a fundraising initiative for charities. Uh, the one flag with that is to make sure you weigh it before it goes out the building, because if it's going out of the building untracked by tenants or, or small groups even within tenancies, then it's not gonna be finding it way, its way into your reporting uh, and as it would be going into recycling, we would hope it's going to um, uh, obviously reduce your overall recycling and recycling rate. So please do just capture that data. But yes, CDS, uh, a great option. And yes, it's being deployed quite widely, particularly in the office sector. And, and there's no reason it wouldn't be done uh, more broadly as well. Alrighty, guys, thank you for joining me today. I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, I'm Blake Lindley, um, Associate Edge Environment, uh, and also consult independently uh, through Cirque Solutions. I'm going to hand you back now to Carlos and Craig in the main room.